Amen. I want to thank Brother Baldwin for that excellent, excellent song there. I, I always love when he sings that song. It just, it just resonates in me. And how fitting, how fitting. A shelter in the time of a storm. I want to welcome everyone to our online worship. I want to thank uh, those who are in attendance. We want to thank our members who are participating via internet. We want to thank those who are following us, who've been following us over the past couple of weeks, who are new to our uh, District Heights. And we also want to welcome those who may be streaming and watching for the first time. Uh, we are a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching congregation. And I believe that God has a word for you this morning. I want to thank Brother Hubbard for this opportunity to stand before you. It is always a privilege to stand before God's people and deliver the word of God. It's not something that we take lightly. Lord, God has a word for everyone. Shelter in the time of the storm. We are in the midst of a storm. We are in the midst of a storm. And as you will see from the lesson this day, the power of God has the power to cease that storm. But while we are in this storm, we are called to do some things differently. And so, again, we want to thank our media ministry for all their hard work and their support. Uh, for being able to uh, bring this message to you via internet. They're doing an excellent, excellent job. And we want you to, to contact us, let us know, give us your feedback and, and let them know also how well they're doing. Uh, we need that feedback in this time. We need that communication. We need to stay connected and we need to stay encouraged. Let us take a moment to pray and then let us get into the message this morning. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you this day. Thankful, Father, for your grace. Thankful, Father, for your mercy. Thankful, Father, for your, your many blessings and your love. Father, we understand that trying times have come. We understand, Father, that the storm is raging about us. But, Father, we just pray and ask that through this storm that your, your power may be revealed to us, Father, and your will and your purpose for our lives may be revealed to us as well. May we have the the desire, Father, to seek your face. May we have the desire, Father, to know and understand just what you will have us to receive from this trial. And we pray and ask, Father, that as we continue to endure, that we will not just be endurers, but we will be overcomers. That by your grace, by your mercy, by your love, we will overcome this storm. We pray, Father, for those who are lost, both spiritually. We pray, Father, that this message may have an impact on them, Father, that they may come to seek you and to know you as we do. We pray, Father, for those who are sick physically, Father, who are dealing with the illnesses throughout the world. We pray, Father, for their healing. We pray, Father, for their restoration. We pray, Father, for those who have, are grieving due to loss in this time, Father. Pray, Father, that you will comfort them and that through all of this trial, Father, and pain, Father, that your will and your purpose may prevail. Now, Father, we ask that you be with us through our time of worship and that you bless this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. It's interesting that the trial that has come upon us has cast us into the midst of a storm. And throughout my conversations with many different people, I keep hearing a recurring question, a recurring theme. And that theme simply is, when will things return to normal? When will things get back to the way they were? And I understand why people are saying that. Many are out of work right now. Many want to get back to working and earning an income for themselves and whatnot. But there's a greater, greater annotation behind that, getting things back to normal. And it leads us to ask the question, just what is normal? What is normal? Hearing this question reminded me of the time when I made the decision to enlist in the military. I decided that I was going to go into the military because I, I, I wanted to earn some money for school. I decided that I had my, my, my life all planned out. I was going to go into the military. I was going to get a job as a, serving as a uh, lab tech, and I was going to, I even decided that I was going to buy me a Mustang 5.0, right? complete with the bells and whistles. Had, a whole, had my whole life planned, but the whole thing was, it was only going to be temporary, and once I had completed my tour, I was going to go back to my life, get back to 
normal. Little did I know that the day that I stepped on that plane, my life would forever and irrevocably be changed. Things for me would never go back to normal. Why do you say that, Brother Bush? Well, I'm glad you asked, because as much as our desire is, as much as our expectation is to get back to normal, this trial that is upon us, this storm that is upon us, has changed our lives forever. If you don't believe that, look around. How we interact with one another has changed. Think about individuals who are seeking to date and to mate. All of that has changed. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna go back to normal because you'll ever have, forever have to ask the question, could this person be infected? Things for us have changed dramatically. But the question is, how will this change impact us? Many of us think that, wow, that's a scary thing that will never get back to normal, but that's only if you think that the change is in a negative way. We cannot go back. We cannot go back. But I'm here to tell you that there is a way forward. There is a way forward. If you will, let us look at the scriptures for this morning. Let us get into the scripture. Let's dive into the word and let's examine just how we're going to move forward with this. Brother, scripture reader, Brother Josh, if you would, please pick it up in Matthew chapter 8 and begin in verse number 18. Great multitudes about, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Then Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury the de their own dead. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? <clears throat> we know the scripture very well. We know this passage of scripture very, very well. But as my mentor likes to say, sometimes you got to know what you're looking at before you can see it. If we go back to verse 18, we go back to verse 18. It says, when Jesus saw the great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. It said, then a certain scribe came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, before we can understand the context of this context of the scripture, we need to understand the characters involved in the scripture. At this particular point in time, Jesus had been traveling throughout the land. He had been performing many miracles and he had been healing a lot of people. And as such, the crowd got larger and larger. And so Jesus is here with his disciples and the multitudes are around him. And this, when we consider the multitudes, we consider who are who make up the multitudes. When we look at the multitudes of people, we understand that there are those who are seeking Jesus' help. But also with, among the multitudes, we'll find that there were certain scribes as well as Pharisees. Throughout the 30-day uh, trial, it's been interesting that when I read through Matthew, it seems like everywhere Jesus went, there was always some Pharisees there criticizing, criticizing, judging. Today we would call those individuals haters. But it was interesting to me that no matter where he went, there they were. They were also his disciples, individuals chosen by Christ to make the journey with him. But it was interesting that all of these characters, everyone involved, they needed to follow Jesus. But only a few got into the boat. We find that situation played out today. No matter whether it was the past or today, we find that the same characters are at play. We have the multitudes. We have those that are seeking Jesus, those that need his deliverance, the lost. We also have those who are the scribes and the Pharisees. We call those the religious, the religious folk who have a form of godliness, but are denying his power. And then we have the disciples, the true followers of Christ. But notice in this particular text, it says that a certain scribe came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. 
Many people claim to love Christ. Many people claim to love Jesus. Many people claim that no matter what, I will follow Christ. But if you notice in verse 23, it says, and he got into his boat. The disciples followed him. The scribe didn't get in. The scribe didn't go. But let's look back. Let's go back just a little bit. And let's look at verse number, 20, verse number 21. It says, then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. The disciples are the ones who were chosen by Christ, the ones who were chosen to make this journey. They were the individuals whom Christ handpicked himself to follow him. But yet these individuals, when it came time to cast out, they had other things that they wanted to do. See, the reason for this is that they had their own expectations about what Christ was there to do. They expected that Jesus would show up and that he would march upon Jerusalem and take back the kingdom. They never once considered their role in this, in this process. And as such, they were content to observe and watch Christ as he performed miracles. But never did they consider their own lives in this process. Much like a soldier who enlists in the military, much like I was when I enlisted in the military, I had plans for my life, but I never considered the fact that I could actually be called up to go to war. I could actually be called to be on the front lines. And many of us find ourselves in situations like that today. Many disciples today, they come to Christ thinking that Christ is going to make everything right, never considering that there is a purpose for their lives in this process. We also have to consider the fact that the expectations that we have don't always match up to reality. This is a very, this, for this very reason, many have turned away from Christ. Many have chosen said, things didn't work out the way I expected. And so I'm going to continue on. I'm going to continue on. But let's look closer. Let's look again. So we have the multitudes. Those are the individuals who need Christ. Also those who mock Christ and those who pretend to follow Christ. And then we have those individuals who also were chosen by Christ. But in verse 23, it says, now he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. His disciples followed him. Now, as they got into the boat, they, considered, they didn't consider the fact that of the destination where the boat was going. They never considered the destination, nor did they consider the journey itself. The journey itself. See, to follow Christ, he has set before us a specific destination, a specific route to follow. As you see, many did not enter the boat. The multitude stayed back behind. The scribes and Pharisees stayed back behind. They went about their own journey on their own way. They decided to take this journey on without Christ. But the disciples, they got in the boat with Christ, but never considered the journey. In order to understand what is happening, we have to take a look at the journey itself. Understand what the journey means, what the journey implies. This journey, quite naturally, is the course of our lives. All of us are on a journey. Every one of us, you, me, Christians, sinners, saint alike, are on a journey. The question is, will you travel this journey with or without Christ? Are you going to go this route? Are you going to go the route that is prescribed for you? Or will you choose your own direction for your life? This is the decision that we're faced. But we have to understand that the, the journey, when Jesus said in Matthew 23, 8 and 23, he said, depart from here to the other side. That was a command. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't, it wasn't something that he asked, or do you feel like going? Or maybe are you up to going? He said, depart and go to the other side. This command is a calling, a calling that is placed upon our lives, a calling that we must understand in order to understand the journey itself. The call of God is an opportunity. It is an opportunity for change, an opportunity for transformation. It is also an opportunity to learn at the master's feet, to be subject to the master, and to have access to the power of the master. This call means many things for different people. But the call of God, the call of God, first and foremost, is a command to move for us to move to a place that we've never been. To go to the other side. In Genesis chapter 12, and verses one and two, 
God commanded Abram to leave his home, leave his and travel to a foreign land. And by faith, he left and traveled and made the journey. This call has a purpose. The purpose of God is that he intends to do a new thing. He intends to do a new thing. Get for me Isaiah 43 and verses 18 and 19. God never calls us, calls us to him to do the same things. He never calls us to do nothing. He never calls us to him to remain the same. I've said many times before that the call of God, the, to do, fulfill the call of God, it will always cause us to go where we don't want to go, do the things we don't want to do in order to be the people we hope to be. This call, this purpose is to do a new thing within us. Read for me Isaiah 43 and verse 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you know it? Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says it like this. He says, but what things were gained to me, these things I have counted lost for Christ. These things I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through Christ which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. The purpose of God is to do a new thing, and we can't do a new thing if we're looking backwards. If we're constantly looking and hoping to go back to the way things were, how can God do a new thing within you? Paul said, those things that were, account that were gained to me, I counted all loss. I'm pressing forward. We have to understand that time moves forward. It doesn't move backward. And though we may desire though we may have the desire and even the expectation to return to the norm, as it is said, the call of God is to move forward in the new. That presents a challenge to us. That presents a challenge, and that challenge is the challenge of obeying God, to trust in God and to exercise faith by moving away from that which is considered the norm, or as we like to call it, our comfort zone. The call of God will always challenge us to move forward. Luke chapter 9 and 62 says that no one can push, put his hands to the plow looking backwards. No one can do this. If you are to follow me, we have to look forward. The command to get on the boat was a call. It was a call of God to move forward, to press forward to new things so that God could do a new thing within us. And the call goes out today. The same call is going forth today. God is challenging us through this storm, through this, this challenge, to move forward, to move forward in him, with him, not looking back, not, not regretting, but with the hope of the new thing, the hope of a new thing. But in order for all this to happen, we've got to be willing to surrender. I know people don't like that word surrender. No, we don't like that word surrender because that word surrender means that we give up control. We lose something. Paul says, I count everything lost for Christ. Count it all lost. Nothing I could have gained, nothing I could have had compares to what I have to gain in Christ. And that is the mindset that we have to have moving forward. That's the mindset that we need to have moving forward. We're set on a journey. We're moving forward. The interesting thing, when we look at the disciples, when we look at them as they got on the boat, not once did they consider that there was a challenge lying ahead of them. But Jesus knew their heart. Jesus knew their heart. Matter of fact, I know, I believe that Jesus knew what was coming ahead. He knew that the storm was coming. He knew that they desired to do other things. They wanted to go bury the dead. They wanted to go say goodbye to their, to their loved ones. But Christ said, if you want to follow me, you have to forsake all. You have to forsake that which you love and trust the most. Not that you have to lose it, because in Christ we have all things. In Christ we have our loved ones. In Christ we have the things that we need and desire. But he has to be first. 
He desires for us to put him first, to follow him without hesitation. But as they were journeying across, you know, Christ immediately got into the boat and he did something interesting. He went to sleep. He went to sleep. He rested. And while he was asleep, the disciples were upon the boat. And I imagine that because he was asleep, they had forgotten that he was even there. That it began to appear to them as if they were in control of where they were going. Many of us are like this in our lives, including those who have named the name of Christ. We forget that Christ is right there, that he's yet, even though he's asleep, he's yet still in control. But yet we have, we fall and find ourselves falling into a false sense of control, thinking that we are in direction and control of where our lives are headed. And in order for us to be awakened, he has to remind us in a powerful way. He has to remind us. And so into everyone's life, a storm must come. A storm must come. Now this storm, this storm is not necessarily there for your destruction. The storm has to come because the storm has a purpose in God's plan. If we look in Matthew chapter eight, verse number 23, pick it up in verse number 24. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. They were on the boat, and he was asleep, and they were going across. When we consider the, the journey as our lives going, all of us were traveling along in this boat, heading in a direction. And for many of us, we were traveling in that, that direction by ourselves. Many of the world have been traveling under their own power, which is no power at all, for far too long. But many of the disciples have been traveling with Christ right there, but we have forgotten that he was in control. This situation that we're facing today, the storm that we are facing today, has a name. It's called COVID-19, Corona. And many of us have become shaken and frightened much as the disciples are. They're afraid because they have forgotten who was in control. They are frightened because they have, have not remembered that which was done before. The disciples all throughout their journey, they watched Christ heal, perform miracles. They watched him do miraculous things. And yet here they are in the midst of a storm and they fear for their lives as if they're going to perish. And Jesus is right there with them. Many of us today have fallen into the same category where we fear that the storm that is raging in our lives is going to cause us to lose our lives. Where's God? Why is this happening? How could God allow this to happen? The storm had to come. The storm had to come. God has a way of, of moving his people back onto his agenda, of getting our attention, and he does it in a mighty way. This storm that came upon him came for a reason. The storm came for a reason. It was a call from God, a call from God to all to get back right with him. To those who were lost, it was a call from God to be reconciled to him. To the religious, it is a call from God to repent and to align yourself with the truth of his word. For the Christian, it is a call from God to stand up and be the light of the world. That light, like a lighthouse in the midst of the storm, shining brightly, guiding those who are in, in the midst of the storm to a safe harbor. We are called to be that light today. It is our light shining, or has COVID dimmed our light. The storm had to come. The storm in your life will always come. God will send a storm because he is looking to get your attention. He is looking to focus your attention on him because he wants to remind you that he is yet in control. We have gotten real comfortable in our lives, moving along, making decisions, thinking about the power that we have, which is no power. But God is yet reminding us that all the things that we thought were important, everything that we thought we had control over is gone. 
And the question is, when will it get back to normal? When will I get that power back? When will I get that control back? You can't get back that which you never had. You cannot receive that back, that which you never had in the first place. This call is a wake, this storm is a wake up call to all to examine yourself, to see what is truth and what is merely your expectations. This storm has to come, but it's not just here for just, just because it's here. It's here with a reason and a purpose, and it has a divine purpose. It has a divine purpose. To the disciples, the storm revealed to them their true nature. Many times over, they traveled with Christ. They stood at the master's feet. They witnessed, they learned from him. Where was their faith? Where was their faith in the midst of the storm? It's interesting that while the storm was raging, they did have the sense to go and seek him out. But it was, it was in the midst of that storm that they sought him out, not from their faith, but from their fear. The storm reveals to us our true nature, where we are. Many of us believe that we are so, so holy, so sanctified, to the point that we're no earthly good. There are those who believe that no matter what I do, no matter what direction I choose, we'll end up at the same destination. Many have that understanding. They fail to realize that the choices we make along the journey will determine our destination. That only those who follow the path outlined by God, who follow the path directed by Christ, will end up at the proper destination. Notice when this storm raged. It doesn't say it in the Bible, but the storm did not just impact the sea. Storms that occur over sea, they impact the land as well. Those who did not get in the boat, it rains on the just and the unjust. The storm came in their lives as well. It wasn't just the disciples, but it will be those who follow God, who follow Christ, who will seek and find the solution to the storm. You can't access the power of the storm if you're not in the boat. In order to get in the boat, they had to have a relationship. They had to have a relationship with Christ. Only those who had a relationship with him got on the boat, his disciples. Only those who have a relationship, who choose to follow Christ, will have access to this power. Those who are left on land have no access to the power. Those who choose to walk in, under their own power will soon find that they have no power. But yet we still seek to get back to what is normal. If no power is what you want to return to, then the only thing you have to do is nothing. Nothing. This storm came also to change our paradigm, to change our understanding to change our thinking concerning the storm, because through the storm, God is revealing his power. He's revealing himself to us. He's reminding us of who he really is. Thank God for the storm. Thank God for the storm. It has a divine purpose, as I said. Matthew chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 26, and verse 69, if you would. Matthew chapter 8, and verse 69. 26, and verse 69. For the disciples, they had to understand where they were in Christ. They understand, had to understand that they had not arrived. They had not reached that point to where they were able to stand on their own. Much like those who have gone before, we too have to come to that understanding that we don't have the power to stand on our own. This storm that is upon us right now is knocking us down, is tossing us back to and fro. It has many people running for shelter, running for that shelter in the storm. But where can we find it? Where can we find it? Where is Jesus in all of this, they say? Where is Christ in all of this? The problem is they can't see past the storm. The storm to them is so great that they can't see anything but the storm. 
This is where the change in our thinking has to occur. The change, the paradigm shift in our way of thinking has to occur. We got to stop telling God how big the storm is and start telling the storm how big our God is. There is nothing greater than he. There's nothing greater than him. No challenge that comes upon us is greater than the power of God. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 29, 26 and verse 69. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by and said, came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. We know this scripture very well. Peter denies Christ three times. This information was revealed to Christ, revealed by Christ that very night. And it was Peter himself who said, I will go to death. I will fight to the death. I will ride or die. If everyone else fails, I will ride or die. Many people claim to know Christ. Many people claim that they will follow Christ until the storm comes. Pray that you're not one of those individuals. What has the storm revealed about you? This situation revealed to Peter that he wasn't who he said he was or who he thought he was. A change had to come about. A change has to come about. We have to get to the point where we understand that no matter what storm comes about us, no matter what challenge comes in our life, that as long as we are, have access to the power, as long as we are with the one who has power, then we are safe. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says that my grace is sufficient for you. Do we have that mindset today? That God's grace is sufficient. Do we understand, as James says in chapter 1, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, do we have the mindset to count it all joy when we find ourselves facing various trials and tribulations, knowing that the testing of our faith is going to produce something? Patience. Some translation says perseverance. The ability to persevere through the storm. And not only persevere, but overcome. Do we have that mindset that we see in Romans chapter 8, get wrote for me Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, if you will. Do we have the mindset that in the midst of the trial to understand that no matter how bad things seem, it's all right. It's all right. I'm going to be okay. We're going to be okay. We're going to persevere. And not only that, we're going to overcome and because of the storm, we're going to be better for it. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says what? And we know that all things... Wait, it says what? We what? We know. We what? We know. We know. What do we know? That all things work together. Well, some things. All things. Some things. All things. Most things? All. All things. We know this. This is the paradigm shift. Many are wondering, why is this happening? What's going on? Even Christians today are wondering, what's going on? Why is this happening? How am I going to get? I got to protect myself. But Paul says that we know. We know that all things, all things what? Work together for good mm -hmm. to those who love God. To those who what? Love God. And? To those who are called, are the called. Are the called. Remember I said, I said a little bit earlier, I said that all of us are being called. All of us are being called, but only a few are responding to the call. Only a few actually responded to the call from Christ to get into the boat. And to, for those who are the called, who have responded to the call of Christ, we know that along this journey, 
we know some things that all things do what? Work together. Work together. For good. For good. Read on. To those who love God. To those who love God. To those who are the called. Who are the called. According to his purpose. According to his purpose, not ours. Remember I said that we were traveling along. We had all kinds of expectations for our lives. We knew where we were going. We knew what we expected. We, had, we, knew, we knew then that we were in control of the boat and everything that's going to happen to the boat. But now God has, has allowed this storm to come into our lives. And we find out just how much control we didn't have. But to those of us who are in the boat with Christ, we know that all things, that this, even this storm, is going to work for the good. It's going to work for the good. This confidence we have, this faith that we have, we have in Christ and not in of ourselves. The storm has a divine purpose. It has a divine purpose. And until we undergo this paradigm shift, we will continue to ask the question, why? Why? When we understand that all things work for the good of those who love God and are the called, because many say they love God, but how many of you are the called, have responded to the call? Can you claim that you know that all things will work for your good? Can you lay claim to that? We know that all things work for our good because we know, having responded to the call, that we also have access to the power of God. We have access to the power, that which has the authority to deliver us from this storm. The only one who can command the storm to cease is the one with, who has the power over the storm. That is God. And in Matthew chapter 28, and verse 18, we know the scripture very well. Get for me 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 5 while we look at Matthew 8, 28 and verse 18. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, Christ says, all authority, all authority, that word authority means power. Power. All power and authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Christ has all power. And in order to have access to the power, you've got to be with Christ. You have to be in Christ. We understand that those who got into the boat, they had a relationship. They had a relationship with Christ. And it's because of that relationship that they were allowed access into the boat. Many of us are looking and wondering, when is this situation going to end or when when can we at least come up with a cure when will this storm cease to rage and we're looking in, in in various places for answers we're looking to the government we're looking to the doctors the scientists to come up with something but again i say to you that the only one who can command this storm to cease is the one who has the authority the power to do so read first corinthians 2 and verse number five that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Ooh, your faith should not be what? In the wisdom of men. In the wisdom of men. But in the power of God. But in the power of God. Where's your faith today? I'm sorry to say, if I'm gonna get any trouble for this, then so be it that the government is not gonna solve this situation. They don't have the power. The doctors and the scientists, they're not going to solve this, not on their own. They don't have the power. It is only when God himself makes the decision to cease the storm. And in order for that to happen, some things have to happen within us. First and foremost, a relationship is required to access this power. Many claim to know Jesus and to follow Jesus, but only those who have this relationship have access to his power. In Matthew 6, and verse 33, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all the other things will be added to you. The things we desire, the things that we need, are found in Christ, in God, in his righteousness. We have but one place to look, 
individuals continue to ask me for my counsel and on various situations, and it seems like every answer I give them is God. And they say, well, why do you keep saying that? Because it's the, it's the truth. He is the only answer. It will not change. You know if you come to me, you know what I'm going to tell you. You know where I'm going to direct you because in him lies all power. Nothing is greater to him, no matter what your situation. Your marriage is failing. You need God. Your health is failing. You need God. Your job, your finances are, are, are in, in dire needs. You need Christ. No matter what your storm is, Christ has the power to cease the storm. But in order for it to stop, you have to have a relationship with him. You have to have this relationship with them. You have to make the decision to be not a religious person, if I may say so, if I may use that term. Someone who has this form of godliness, always learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Going around shouting, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I love Jesus. But when they pray, their prayers go no further than the top of their skull because they don't have the relationship. They don't have the power. They don't have access to the power. In order for this to come to an end, we've got some things we need to do. We've got some decisions we need to make. In order to have this relationship with Christ, first and foremost, we have to seek him out. We have to seek him out. Give for me Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. We've heard this scripture. It's a familiar scripture. Matter of fact, since this whole crisis has began, this scripture has been flooding the Internet. But many don't understand just what it means. They don't understand what they're doing when they, when they quote this, when they, when they text this and send this. Do they really understand what it is that they're, is what they're sending in this message, in this scripture? In order for us to have that relationship, we've got to seek the face of God. Read, read 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. If my people... If my people... Wait. My people. Who are his people? Well, some would argue, well, God, God, all, all people belong to God. That's true. All people do belong. All souls belong to him. Yes, this is true. This is very much true. But in this particular passage of scripture, he's talking to a specific group of individuals. He says, if my people, read on. Who are called by my name. Who are what? Called by my name. We've talked about the calling. We've talked about who those individuals are who are called by my name, who have answered the call, who have responded to the call, who have this relationship with me. If my people will do what? Will humble themselves. Humble themselves. And pray and seek. And pray and oh, do what? Pray and seek. And seek what? My face. Stop right there. Pray and seek my face. I don't, I don't have to go into praying and being humble. Brother Hubbard has covered that beautifully over the last few weeks. And if you've been tuning in, you, you already have that information. If not, I suggest you go back and look at some of the previous uh, sermons from, from this past month. They're available on Facebook as well, as well as the website. But seek my face. What does that mean? What does that mean to seek my face? The Hebrew word for face in the Old Testament is often translated as presence. Presence. When we seek the face of God, we are seeking his presence. The call to seek God's face is issued to his people because they abandoned, because they had abandoned him and needed to return to him. A person's face reveals much about his or her character and personality. When we see the inward emotions of a person expressed outwardly on the face, the face is very, very vital because there we actually see the character of a person is revealed in the face. We recognize a person by looking at his or her face. There's recognition. There's acceptance. In Psalms 105 and verse four, God's faithful ones were called to seek his face always. So we, too, those who even who are faithful, were called to seek God's face because even we 
have, even though we have not abandoned him, there are times when we neglect to pursue him. Much like the disciples in the boat, they had forgotten about Christ. Even though they had been faithful in following him, they had forgotten about him. And even they, at that time, needed to seek his face. The true nature of worship, hear me when I say this, the true nature of worship is to seek the face of God. To seek the face of God is to seek his presence. It is to seek his thoughts. It is to seek his ways. It is to seek his conscience. Seeking God's face is seeking his counsel. Seeking his will. Seeking his understanding. Seeking his direction. Seeking his righteousness. And seeking his peace. And one that's not there as well is seeking his purpose. This is the true nature of worship. I know right now many of us are, are wondering when we'll be able to come back together again and worship collectively in the, same, in the same building. And again, people are crying out to go back to the way things were, to, to get back to the normal. Well, I tell you that the normal, even when it comes to the worship of God, there were many who were present physically, but they were absent from the worship because they were not seeking God's face. Times like this have come now to remind us the importance of coming together, of being mutually encouraged by one another, of seeking the presence of God. But does that have to take place here? No. Right now you're watching, you're streaming live. But hopefully you too, in the presence of your own home, are seeking the presence of God. Are you seeking his face? Are you seeking his understanding and not your own? Are you seeking his purpose in this storm? Are you seeking his understanding, his counsel, his direction, where we will go from here? How to move forward. Seeking the face of God is an intimate thing. It's an intimate thing. To be face to face with another individual that's intimate. They invite you into their space. They invite you into their spirit. When we seek the face of God, we are seeking to be that intimate relationship, that intimate connection with God. I'd like to read something for you from Psalms 27. If you will, turn there with me. Psalms 27. Psalms 27. It says, the Lord is my light. In verse 1, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may arise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that, that, that one thing I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high on a rock. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, my heart, not my lips, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. 
Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. That word salvation can be translated as deliverance. O God of my deliverance, who will deliver us from this storm? Who will deliver us from from this storm? I say to you, those who seek the face of God. Those who seek the face of God. And in order to seek God's face, we have to do it with faith. Faith. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 26, the disciples sought after Jesus to save them from the storm, to rescue them in the time of need. And yes, they did well to seek God, to seek his, to seek his solution, but they did so out of fear. They did so out of fear. We throw this thing around called faith, and, and the world says that there is a, a lack of faith. We, we, we need more faith. I, I, I disagree. I say to you that every day, every one of us demonstrates faith. The problem is we demonstrate faith in the wrong things. We exercise faith in the wrong things. Scripture tells us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11 and 1. It is the evidence of things not seen. It's interesting, this virus, this coronavirus, we can't see that with our eyes. This tiny little microscopic thing that no one can see has got the world turned upside down. And it's interesting also that what will restore the world or help us move past the situation is something that is not seen also. That is our faith, the evidence of that which is not seen. And what is that evidence? That evidence is, is ev- our faith is evidence. Hear me when I say this. Our faith is the evidence of the power of God. When you tell people, when people say, how are we going to get through this? And you try to tell them that God is going to do they look at you like you're crazy. But I tell you, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. We hope and pray to get through this situation. But it is the evidence of things not seen, and that is the power of God to deliver us. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must what believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. There it is again. We have to seek him. We have to seek after the face of God. Second Timothy 1 and verse 7 says that for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of sound mind. Why do we fear? As Christ said, why are you, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? Why are you afraid? How important is our faith? How important is our faith? If you will, I like you will allow me. I see the time is running down, but if you'll allow me, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, In this you greatly rejoice for a little while. If need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory of the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing You rejoice and joy inexpressibly a full glory, receiving, really hear me now, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How important is faith? Though we may be grieved by the various trials, though we may be grieved by what's going through, we greatly rejoice because we know that on the other side of this trial, God has a great blessing. God has a purpose for the trial. God has a purpose for the trial in our lives. And that if we will seek his faith, face and have faith, he will deliver us from this time. So I'll leave you with one question. How will this storm change you? 
How will this storm change you? The storm is here. It's not coming, it's here. And the sad fact of it is that there is no going back. There is no going back. So the question is, how will you move forward? Will you move forward with faith? Will you move forward with confidence? Will you make the decision to seek God's face, to seek his righteousness, to seek his understanding, and most importantly, to seek his purpose? Will you allow his spirit to transform you in this time? Or will you be succumbed by the storm? I hope this message has, uh, has encouraged you in some way, has helped you to understand what's going on in this time, and also to understand that there is a way out. There is a way out. For those of you who are seeking Christ, who need Christ, there's only one way to access the power, and that is to be placed in Christ. And the Bible tells us what we must do in order to be placed in the Christ. We must hear, believe, and have faith in the gospel. And the gospel is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sins and for mine. We have to have faith. There's that word again. We have to have faith in that word. And then we have to repent. We have to repent. And repentance is we have to make a decision to turn away from our error and turn to God, to turn to Christ. We have to make the choice to get on the boat. And then we do so by obeying the fact of that gospel, by dying to our sins, being buried in a watery grave, and being raised to walk in newness of life. Baptism doth now place us in Christ. And that, it, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. For we, we, we examine how those who have been placed in Christ still, still have to struggle, still have to endure the storm. So once you've been placed inside of Christ, once you've been placed into the body of Christ, you then have to live a life of faithfulness, being faithful until death, even until death. For those of you who are in religious error, you too need to repent. Turn from your error and turn back to Christ. We have to get back to the Bible. I said we are a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching congregation. We've got to get back to the Bible. For to have a relationship with God is to know him. And the only way we can know him is we have to know his word. We have to come in contact with the blood through his word and by his spirit. If you are in the body of Christ and you found that you have been forgetting God, forgetting that he's there, if you haven't been seeking his face, if you haven't been putting him first, then the opportunity is for you to repent as well. If you're in need of assistance, if you're in need of any way, if there's any way that we can help you, assist you, we ask that you reach out to us. Give us a call. We're here. We'll study with you. We'll baptize you if need. We'll counsel you. We'll encourage you, whatever your needs. So at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Baldwin to come forth and lead us in a song of invitation, and then we'll come back and pray. <laughs>